There we go. Okay. Okay, so hello, everybody. Um, we've got people online and people in the room here, so I'm talking to both of you. Um, I'm Professor Coton, and I'm going to talk to you about a field course that we're offering this summer, actually for the third time, Arctic Field Ecology. Um, I want to let people know how it's going to work and give you some kind of preparation if you'd like to potentially enroll in the course. So this is the designation. Um, it's actually in the calendar as Biology Field Research, Bio332. Unofficially, we call it Arctic Field Ecology. Um, it's going to be offered in July and August of this year. Um, we don't know the exact dates yet. I've requested July 25th to August 8th. So hopefully we'll be able to confirm that before too long. Um, I'm Professor Coatman, the instructor, Department of Biology here. There's my contact information. And I'll tell you now that we're going to make both the recording of this talk and also my slides available online. So if you want to refer back to them and get this information again, it should be there for you. So just a couple of words about myself. This is me. Um, what I actually mostly study nowadays is plant invasions, non-native species. I also work on plant herbivore interactions, things that actually attack and eat plants. And um, I've worked in Churchill periodically since 1984. So next year is the 40th year, actually. Um, but I've worked in lots of other places as well. I've worked all over Southern Ontario and in the Arctic, I've worked in Western Hudson Bay, the Kivalik region, the Gamaski Island in James Bay, Violet Island in the far north, Southampton Island, um, at a fair range of Arctic sites. <clears throat> the field course is going to be held at the Churchill Northern Study Center, where the red dot is on this map, on the west coast of Hudson Bay at about 58 degrees north, just south of the uh, Northwest Territory or the Nunavut boundary in Manitoba. Um, we'll be based at the field station here, the Northern Study Center. It's a lovely new field station. It's about 12 years old. Um, it provides accommodation, it provides food, it provides transport and logistical support while we're, while we're there. It's also the main base where I'm actually doing my own research at this point. Um, the CNSC is about 25 kilometers east of the town of Churchill. So Churchill's our access point. Um, Churchill's a small town, although it's not small by Arctic standards. It's got about 900 residents, um, but it's also about 250 kilometers to the next town that's any larger. So um, it's um, a small town, but again, it's in the world of small towns. It's very well set up for the kind of thing we want to do. There's access. Um, again, there is a town there. There's also a local airport. It's got quite a long history. Um, of course, it's got thousands of years of occupancy by native peoples. The Hudson Bay Company opened a post there starting in 717, and there's been a town there ever since. It's a grain port. Um, you can see the grain elevator in the background. So they actually ship things from central Canada up through there and out through Hudson Bay. And again, it works well for us because it has amenities. There's a grocery store, hardware store, liquor store, souvenir shop, restaurants. Uh, very helpfully, there's a hospital. Again, it's a small town, but it does actually have a lot of resources that many northern towns lack. How do you get there? Well, here's your first challenge. Again, there's no road access to Churchill. Um, the way that people normally drive or normally get there is to fly. Um, and the route from the GTA is first you fly to Winnipeg and there are several carriers that do that. There are multiple flights daily. Then you need to fly from Winnipeg to Churchill. There's only one airline that currently does that, um, Comair International. Um, I'll warn you now, it's not on the, um, various aggregators like Travelocity, you need to book with them directly. But they also fly near near daily flights between Winnipeg and Churchill. Um, if you're lucky, some flights um, sometimes go through Rankin Inlet and none of it turn around and actually come south, which is a, an interesting little extension to the trip. The other way to get there is, again, there is a rail line to Churchill. In fact, it's the only place on Hudson Bay that's got a permanent ground link with the outside world. And they do run passenger trains up from Winnipeg. 
Um, every year we get some students who do this. It's a great trip, but it's also a multi-day trip. Uh, it takes, it's over three days to actually travel there. So you potentially could save a lot of money, but know what you're getting yourself into. The reason we do this course at Churchill is partly just that it's a great environment. Um, Churchill's located just north of the tree line. Um, so we're right at the edge of the Arctic tundra, the sea level tundra. Um, it's a permafrost region. The entire area is permafrost or uh, permafrost influence. But we're also close to the tree line, so we can actually access areas in the northern boreal forest as well. And in fact, we'll visit lots of sites in both the boreal and tundra while we're there. Um, the town is actually on uh, the Churchill River, right at the mouth of the river on Hudson Bay. Um, we're close to the coast for the entire trip as well. So we also have access to coastal sites and the Hudson Bay estuary. And finally, this is a really wet landscape. This is basically a northern extension of the Great Plains, so it's fairly flat. Uh, combined with permafrost, there are lots of ponds, lakes, small streams we, we potentially can visit and work in. Um, I primarily work with plants, so I'll quickly mention, um, again, we've got lots of both tundra and boreal species present. Um, you're looking at white spruce here. This is a tree-lined tree. So that's what passes for a tree in Churchill. Um, lots of heath and lichen dominated tundra, also peatlands, sedge fens, really typical vegetation for southern tundra or extreme northern boreal systems. But the reason most people go to Churchill is for wildlife. Um, it's a great place to see um, Arctic and boreal wildlife. Um, so there's a diverse bird community. Um, there's one example I've worked with on the left. Those are lesser snow geese, which are something I've studied for many years. Also Arctic birds like ptarmigan, Jaeger, lots of shorebirds, songbirds. It's also good for mammals. Um, the one mammal I guarantee you will see is, is beluga whales. If you don't see belugas, there's something seriously wrong. Um, but we also got caribou, Arctic fox, red fox, um, polar bears, especially in August. I'm going to give you the disclaimer I always give you, which is that this is these are wild animals and we don't guarantee them. Um, you know, hopefully we'll see all of these things, um, but it's not up to me. If you want to go on a wildlife tour, go on a wildlife tour. Um, but we do actually make every effort to see whatever we can see. Um, last year, we did, in fact, have. We did have caribou during the course. We had lots of red foxes, bears, belugas. Uh, Arctic hare and other other creatures. Churchill's an interesting place historically. Again, for hundreds of years, it's been a contact point between several native groups, Cree, Dene, Inuit, I should also mention Métis, and Europeans. This is the Prince of Wales Fort on um, the other side of the river, which we will plan to visit while we're actually there. This is the original Hudson Bay Company Fort. Um, there's several really good local museums in town um, that document local history and Inuit art. Um, and again, there's the fort itself, the 18th century Prince of Wales fort across the river. So these are all places we'll try to visit during the course. It's a busy course, but we'll, we'll make sure you get at least one free day in town to actually explore what's what's there. But I want to remind you, this really is an undergraduate course. This is a half credit course. Um, it just happens to be offered during the summer semester. It's two weeks, but it's a very intense two weeks. You really don't get much spare time. We work pretty much every day, um, either visiting field sites or working on projects. The usual pattern is that we'll do local trips most days, usually in the morning or early or, or afternoon. I also do give lectures on this. Um, so you will be getting formal lectures, usually in the evening as well. So there's lots of field time, but there is some formal lecture com uh, content. We also usually hit up other local researchers for lectures as well, since there are a lot of research groups that work at this site. And so if we can twist somebody's arm, we'll get them to give you a lecture on their particular subject as well. Last year, we had Arctic foxes and, and bears were the two, the two big lectures. Um, you do do a mini project during the course. Um, 
what we essentially do in the first week is try to introduce you to the site, show you around enough that you have some ideas for you know potential projects. Then we give you several days to collect data, write up a mini project. Uh, you'll present your results to the class and there'll be a final project report due after the end of the course. Um, and again, there is evaluation. So you'll get a couple of quizzes during the course. We'll get you to present your project idea. And again, we'll grade your final project report among other, among other things. Churchill's a pretty forgiving place to, to visit in July and August. Um, it's not especially cold at that time of year. Um, an average daytime temperature is around 12 degrees, but it's very variable. So even in July, we can get days that are close to zero. We can also get days that are above 30, um, which can be really challenging. Um, it's a really uncomfortable environment, frankly, when it's that hot. I prefer the 12 degree days. It's a rainy environment. Um, we It's a coastal site. We do get a lot of coastal rainfall, also fog. Um, in other words, I for those of you going the, on the trip, I'll give you packing instructions, but basically you have to be prepared for everything. Um, pretty much anything can happen during July and August. I'll also mention that um, this is really the land of biting flies. So mosquitoes, black flies, deer flies can be really abundant. Um, you might think you've seen mosquitoes. If you haven't been up to the boreal, you have not. Um, so again, we'll give you advice about insect repellent, insect nets, et cetera. Um, frankly, it varies from year to year. If it's windy or you're out near the coast, it's usually not bad. If it's 30 degrees still and you're in the boreal, it can be pretty awful. So come prepared. Um, one other thing about the course that's a bit unusual is um, safety. Um, you have to understand that um, wherever you go on this course, you'll be with me or with a couple of qualified TAs um, because this isn't the kind of environment where you can safely wander around by yourself. Um, and here's the reason. Um, this is a really high polar bear site. Um, last year we saw 10 or 12 during the course. These ones actually came out while I was lecturing about annual plants and appeared behind me while I was trying to talk. Um, we all have experience working with polar bears. We have polar bear training and we all carry firearms throughout the course. Uh, good for discipline. Um, but again, you can't go for a walk on your own. You can't go out at night. We put every effort into getting you to every ecosystem we can during the course. But rest assured that we have training, we have experience, and we're there to keep you safe while we do it. Um, there are some other opportunities. Um, again, we'll spend at least a day in Churchill itself, probably more than that. You also can potentially get local tours. Um, there's an excellent local tour company that goes on a beluga, actually a couple of kinds of beluga whale trip on the river, that go across to the fort. Um, these aren't especially expensive add-ons. Um, we may be able to pay for them out of course funds, but if not, I really encourage you to pay a little extra money and go on one of these. It's well worth the investment. In late August, there are literally hundreds of blue whales in the river. Um, uh, they're sort of ridiculously abundant um, and it really is a good investment. So costs, now this is the one thing, this is the one real barrier for the course, and we know this, this is an expensive course. The way that it works is that you have to pay a regular half course fee, um, but there are a couple of other expenses. The first one is room and board. Um, so last year it cost about 1300 bucks for two weeks at the study center. Um, I will tell you from Arctic standards, this is dirt cheap. Um, but it is an expensive place to stay. The good news is you get a room. You also get all of your meals. All of that's covered while you're, while you're there. Um, if you are going, there will be a deposit you have to pay in advance, but the majority of it will be paid um, during the course. You also are responsible for your own airfare. You have to pay for your getting yourself there. Um, last year, it was about 550 bucks to Winnipeg and 1770 to Churchill. Um, I'm going to mention in a couple of in a minute a couple of ways you could help get around some of these costs. 
But it is an expensive course, and there's not really anything we can do about it. Frankly, it's the cost of working in northern Canada. There are, however, a couple of things that you may find helpful. Um, one is that the experiential learning office here does offer bursaries for this course. So if you're eligible, um, you potentially can get money from them. So the basic bursary is 500 bucks. You have to demonstrate financial need, which for most students is not a problem. Um, uh, last couple of years, we've actually had a fair number of students who've gotten these. You can actually you can actually potentially make a case for more funding. Um, so again, they also will make exceptions. So it's worth talking to them and seeing what they can actually help you with. So they're here, they're there to help defray the court the costs. And I would recommend you all apply. There also are a couple of ways you potentially can cut corners. Um, you often get quite cheap flights to Winnipeg. Um, Toronto to Winnipeg is not the problem. Last year, you could get a flight there for 140 bucks at one point. Um, the expensive part is the part from Winnipeg to Churchill. That's on Calm Air. Um, Calm, Calm Air actually ex accepts both Air Canada frequent flyer miles and air miles. So if you've got any air points saved up, they actually accept them at par. Inexplicably, they consider Churchill to be a local flight. So if you have any air miles at all, you potentially can get a good deal on a flight. There also are student fares if you're under 24. Um, I don't know how much of a discount they get. You have to actually ask them directly. It says on their webpage. When you book your flight, make sure your ticket is as flexible as possible. Um, delay is common in Northern flights. Um, because of weather and other reasons, um, it's not unusual for Calm Air to be late, sometimes very late. We were eight hours late getting out last year. Um, so it's a good idea to um, make sure there's lots of time for your connections, minimum three to four hours. Um, actually, last year going up at one point, the flight was three days late. <laughs> so hopefully that doesn't happen to you. Last time I flew back, it was seamless. But... It's worth paying a few bucks extra for a ticket you can actually change. Um, the really cheap way of getting there is to take rail. You can save about a thousand bucks by taking the train from Winnipeg to Churchill. But as I said, it's a major time commitment. It's 44 hours over three days. Um, um, also, that doesn't get you a bed, that just gets you a seat. So if your back is resilient enough, and we had several people do this last year, it's actually an interesting way of getting there and saving a lot of money, but it does um, take a significant commitment in, in time. Um, we also have people who go one way by train and the other way by flight. Um, there are other even trickier ways of saving money. If you're really stuck, ask me. I can tell you some of the creative things that people have done, not all of, all of which I recommend. But frankly, if you can afford the ticket, the best thing to do is fly to Winnipeg, fly to Churchill. That's what I do. But... Uh, at the very least, you should make sure you can get whatever discounts are available. Yeah, Mary. Yeah, Mary. The train is usually reliable, except last year they had a derailment in the middle of the... And um, so what they wound up having to do was they actually were running the train from Churchill to Thompson, Manitoba, and then putting people on a bus for Winnipeg. Um so like any other train trip, it can happen, but usually the train is pretty reliable. To be honest, usually the flights are pretty reliable too. It's not uncommon for them to be an hour late, but some of the examples I gave you are pretty exceptional. Um, I should say, by the way, Calm Air is a big airline um, by Northern standards. I mean, they actually fly things like 737s. They fly things like sizable turbo props. Again, it's not like you're flying up there, you know, on some kind of primitive bush plane. These are regularly scheduled, um, scheduled flights. Um, enrollment will be in the spring semester. Um, well, I'm not quite sure when it's going to open yet. I think last year it was March. Um, the um, there are a few prerequisites, but they're fairly minimal. You need six credits and a registration in biology or some kind of allied program, like get ecology, environment, geography, earth science. 
you also need permission of the instructor. So what we get you to do is to submit an actual application. I read all of them and I prioritize them. And I do make exceptions. Um, you know, if there's someone who's got a good case and doesn't come from the kind of background we're expecting, I'll take a good look at it. Um, we recommend you have a statistics course. Um, again, you do have to do a project in this course and we don't really have time to teach statistics. So you need to have enough to actually get yourself through a project. If you're not from U of T or from another campus, um, it's certainly possible to substitute other courses for these. So you have a question? What's, what's 259? Oh yeah, it'll it'll be fine. I mean, it, it's only recommended preparation anyway. I mean, as long as you think you can handle the statistics you're gonna do. You also design your own project. So if your statistical background isn't exceptionally strong, don't do some kind of killer multivariate curve fitting project, do a t-test. So to some extent, it's up to your own common sense to make it work. Okay. Um, admission is not directly through ACORN the U of T admission program. Um, instead, what we'll do is set up a web page where you submit your CV, your transcript, and a short paragraph explaining why you want to go on the course. Um, there'll probably be separate portals for U of T and non-U of T students, but they'll work basically the same. And again, I'll review there, review the information. Um, again, I do this partly because we have more applicants than we can accommodate. Last year we had 24 applicants, 10 spaces. Um, I also do it frankly, just to make sure people are prepared. Like when you submit a short paragraph, I'm not really asking for anything in real detail. I just want some idea, you know what you're getting into. So if someone sends me a paragraph saying they want to look at penguins and ride killer whales or something, I know I've got a problem. Um, so if you're worried about requirements, talk to me, but Basically, we just try to screen applicants a bit to make sure you know what you're getting into. Okay. And the basic contact for this course is me. Um, again, we'll be doing another information session in the spring, um, but I'm always available. So email me or phone me or drop by my office if you've got questions. If you've got questions specifically about registration, ask um, our undergraduate advisor, Diane Mathias, she handles the nuts and bolts of registration. But anything to do with the course content, how we, how we handle it, what we expect, talk to me instead. So that's all I really wanted to tell you about the course, but just to give you an idea of why we do it, let me show you a few photos uh, that were taken in the last couple of years. So this is what some of the coastal roads look like. Um, this is out quite close to Hudson Bay um, on really quite nice quality coastal tundra. Um, the Northern Study Center is a bit weird. It's built on the site of a former experimental rocket launching center. So it's littered with things like this. Um, it adds a certain kind of post-apocalyptic charm to the whole experience. Um, this coming summer is gonna be the peak for Northern Lights in the solar cycle. Um, you've got a pretty good chance of seeing them as long as it's clear. They get a lot of cloudy nights. Um, any night it's clear, I recommend you go and look. We had some nice displays last year. Again, just another coastal tundra shot. Um, this is what the northern boreal forest looks like. So this is only a couple of kilometers away from the tree line, but really different habitat, really different plants and animals. And again, we'll be visiting sites like this through the course as well. It's a permafrost influenced area. Um, these are pulses. I'll talk about them during the course, but they're actually permafrost cord hills that are rising out of the surrounding wetland. Um, typical northern sedge, cotton grass, or area off from this is sort of an iconic northern plant. Common legume. They're bald eagles all over the state. We see tons of them. Um, they nest there. I mentioned snow geese briefly. Um, they don't actually nest around the study center. They nest further out um, towards Cape Churchill, but usually by late summer, we have groups of them that have finished nesting that start passing through. So 
hopefully we'll have a chance to see some. This is a bird, again, I've worked on since 1984, off and on. Arctic fox. Um, two years ago, we saw tons of these during the course. Last year, we saw none. Um, it just depends where they have a den that particular year. So if we're lucky, we'll have, they'll have a denning close to us. Um, these are one of the ones that turn white in the winter. So in winter, this is a snow white animal, unless you're in Iceland. Um, but um, in summer, they adopt these brown coats, and they can actually be sort of hard to see. You'll realize they're looking at you, and you haven't noticed them yet. Red foxes are common on the site. This is the more southern fox, and this is actually a contact zone between them. In fact, there's sort of a low-level war going on between the two species right now. Uh, Pacific loon, if you know loons from northern Ontario, that's the southern loon. This is the northern loon. So these breed all through the Canadian Arctic. Willow ptarmigan, the chicken of the north, um, are everywhere. They're also delicious. Here's just flying over the Churchill River, just one small group of beluga whales. So this is what the river looks like in late summer. Again, there are hundreds and hundreds of whales that spend late summer in the river mouth. Hudsonian godwit. I think there are only about 75,000 of these in the world. Um, this turns out to be one of the nesting strongholds for them. So it's a threatened bird, but it nests right along the tundra boreal boundary. And I'll just leave with this guy, um, actually girl, who decided to walk across the road during the course last year. Um, um, for the record, I was in a vehicle when this was taken. This is taken through a windshield. Um, it was also way closer than I'd voluntarily approach a bear, even in a vehicle, but it came out of the ditch beside the road. So there's a whole van full of very excited students taking photos and me so, trying to slowly back away from it at the same time. That's all I wanted to tell you right now. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. And again, you're also welcome to hunt me down whenever you want and, and talk to me about the course. So it looks like there's one question out there. I already answered it. Um, anything else I can tell you? What's that? What's a day like? Well, in the first half of the course, um, we'll try to get the study center provides vehicles of various reliability. Um, so what we'll try and get is a mid-sized van that we can pack everybody into. So for the first half of the course, we just drive off somewhere in the local road network. So there may be about 50 kilometers of road locally that give access to tundra and boreal sites. And we do pretty much all of them by the end of the course. So we'll drive out, we'll look at something. We'll come back for lunch usually, or sometimes take lunch with us. We'll go out in the afternoon, look at more sites. I'll talk about plants, animals, tundra ecology. And then in the evening, like I say, many days we come back for a lecture. In the second half of the course, it's more devoted to your own projects. So again, we help you try to concoct a project during the first half of the course. Once the initial field part is over, we'll give you about three days to collect data, a couple of days to actually write it up. And then you present your preliminary results to the class before the end of the course. The final assignment will be due sometime after the course is officially over in early fall. Um, we do give you a lot of field time on this, even on days that are, um, well, on days that are days you're collecting data, you're gonna be out in the field collecting data. But even in days where there aren't regularly scheduled trips, we'll still usually go out, we'll look for stuff and we, we pay attention. Um, Again, there are a lot of researchers at the study site, so we get reports of interesting things to go and find, so we go and find them. Yes. Sorry? Uh, we don't have an opening date for the applications yet. It's probably going to be in March sometime. Um, um, I'll do uh, another information session in the spring, and we'll get the word out in social media about opening dates. Um, do you remember what when we had them closed last year? I I think we closed them sometime in like late May, but don't don't hold me to that. So we 
we do give you a month or a month and a half to um, to actually register. Again, the registration procedure is not difficult. Like I said, I do ask for a couple of bits of information, but it'll take you 10 minutes. You just need to be have made the decision you really want to do this by the time the, the website opens. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know what a half course fee is right now? Do you know what a half course fee is? The the guess is 600 bucks, which for a 0.5 course, which I sounds about right to me, but I'm honestly not sure. Um, I'll just emphasize that's for any course that you take in the summer. If you take a course in biochemistry in the summer, you'll pay a course fee. So that's the one thing that goes to the university. Yeah. Probably Diane. Yeah, the person you should contact is Diane Mathias. Her email is in this talk somewhere. If you have trouble finding it, you can contact me. Um, I'll tell you the way that you do it is that you'll need a letter of permission from your own university to take an external course. Those are fairly routine, um, so they're not hard to get. And then once you have that, that'll allow you to enroll in the course like, like other students. But there will be that one extra step of permission from your university to make sure you get credit for the course. Again, we have had students do this before. It's not a huge problem. Yeah. Is there a grade requirement? No. I mean, I'll. the question was, was there a grade requirement? No. I mean, I do tend to favor students with, with higher grades, um, um, but it's not absolute. And um, uh, if you're worried about it, it's something to talk to me about. We do get a variety of students from diverse backgrounds um, so yeah, higher grades help, but they're not a prerequisite. Yeah. Yeah. How long is the day? Well, it's sort of determined by the study center. So usually we'll eat breakfast and they serve breakfast Sometime between seven and eight, it, it, it actually varies depending on who's cooking. Um, so we'll, you have to get up. If you want breakfast, you have to be there at breakfast. By eight o'clock or nine o'clock, we'll be out in the field. Again, we may come back for lunch or we may not. Um, dinner is early. It's, it's, it's five o'clock. So normally we'll try to be back by, by five and again, there may be things we do after dinner. Um, you may get a lecture or we may go back out in the field again. Um, there's not much point in just sitting around the study center. So we try to use the time that we have. So they're long days, but I'd like to think they're interesting. Ones. It's seven days a week. No, you've only got two weeks up there. So we pack it in. Like I say, we'll give you one day in town um, um, except a lot of people would use that to do a whale tour or something like that. Um, the other thing is what happens on rainy days. Um, last couple of years, we've been fairly lucky, but once in a while you'll wake up and it's just driving horizontal sleet. We'll just go back to bed. Um, but hopefully that doesn't happen too often. Yeah. Very good. No, we, we don't ask for a language exam or anything like that. Um, although, you know, be aware of your own abilities. You know, if that's a problem for you, it may be a problem on the course. But as long as you're registered as a student, that's all we need to know. Yeah. Around how many students are accepted? Last year, we accepted 10. Um, this year, I'm hoping to bump it up slightly. We might be able to do 12. Um, the two limitations we have are we need to book rooms at the study center. And so they tell us how many we can take. And we need to be able to get everybody into a vehicle. So that's what actually sets the ceiling on the, on the course. 
Yeah. Can you purchase food offered outside? Sort of. Um, the station is pretty good at accommodating um, um, like dietary needs, religious needs, um, common allergies. Um, if you have some really unusual need, then it may be difficult for them to actually do that. But things like kosher or halal food or vegetarian food are not a problem. Um, we will get into town periodically. Uh, we'll have one day in town. We'll probably pass through town a number of times. So if you really can't live without Cheetos or something, um, yeah, you'll get a chance to pick some up. But be warned, Churchill is not a very big place. And so again, if there's something that you can't live without, bring it with you. Yes. Okay, so there are two kinds of end of course assignments. And if you're interested, email me. I can send you the syllabus from last year. It hasn't been updated yet. But what we'll do is we'll get you to at the end of the course in Churchill, you'll present a brief presentation to the class about your research. So it'll be a 10 minute or 15 minute presentation on what you did, what you found. After the course is over, sometime probably in September, we'll get you to submit a final written report. Um, that you can just email to me. So there's no reason you have to be physically here for that. But it is a substantial part of your grade. And so after the course, you will have to mail me your final report. The reason we do it that way is that there's not enough time in the course for you to do a fully researched lab report, which essentially is what we're asking for. So you'll need time to actually polish the statistics. You'll need time to look up references. So rather than try to make you do that during the course, we'll give you a few, a few weeks after the course to, to complete that and send it in. Yes. Oh, how is the internet at the station? Um, both internet and cell service at the station are surprisingly good, especially internet. Um, they, um, it is, however, patchy. Um, so if you're lucky, you'll be at a room that's got great reception. If not, you may have to go to the kitchen or something to check your phone. Um, in town, there's good cell phone reception. Um, but in most of the area, there's not. So if you're not at the station or in town, you probably won't have reception, except for this one mysterious pocket near the airport that we can't explain. We can almost get the internet there, and I don't know why. <laughs> yes. Is anyone who's not currently a student, can they apply? I honestly don't know. That, that's a question for Dan Mathias, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you can't, you can't go out at night. Um, yes, because of those, um, the, um, however, um, one thing that they do have is there's this good observation deck at the station. In fact, there are two of them, um, which are high enough off the ground that they're safe. Um, so if you want to go out and look at Northern lights or something, you can do that. If you want to go out for a walk, not really. <laughs> Um, I should mention, by the way, this is fairly far north and this is summer, so days are pretty long. Um, so, again, there is a, when the sun's setting at like 1030 at night, there is a bit of leeway there. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if you have another question, I'll give you just a second to sneak it in. Otherwise, I'm going to remind you that we'll put an edited recording of this. We'll make it available. Um, we'll also make my slides available. Um, I presume there'll be a link on the bio page or on, yeah. But you'll send it out in social media or how will people find out about it?
Okay. So it'll be posted on the uh, biology YouTube channel. It'll be uh, advertised in social media. And again, if you can't find it, just email me. Um, yeah, it'll be on the biology webpage. So, but yeah, but again, that's me. So if uh, you have trouble finding something, just contact me directly. Another question? Yeah. Yeah. The question is, are you going to be just doing measurements for your own project or for other things? Well, it depends. Um, I mean, the main thing we have to do is to make sure you collect the data you need for your own project. Um, so that takes priority. But we are doing research there at the same time. And if people have time and of interest and want to help us, like in the field at the same time, yeah, we potentially can do that as well. Um, we had one student stay on two years ago after the course for another couple of weeks and actually assist with research like that. Um, so again, the main priority is your own project and that'll probably keep you busy, but, um, but yeah, if you want to try and get involved with our own work, there might be possibilities there. Um, I should give you an idea of the kind of projects that people do. I mean, people always worry about what they're going to do in three days. And frankly, that's our problem. We, we help you try to develop that. So last year, for example, we had someone who, we had a couple of people look at carnivorous plants and look at prey capture and carnivorous plants, what they are capturing. Um, we had one student who wanted to know whether leaves of one particular carnivorous plant were acting as attractants. And she actually got food coloring and made them different colors to see if that actually had an effect on food capture. Um, it's a really a good idea. Um, we had, uh, there are a lot of leaf galling wasps up there that lay eggs and leaves. And we had people looking at uh, how big the galls were, what color they were, how that was affected by where they were on the plant and this kind of thing. We had a terrific project last year with this one student who managed to endear herself to the beluga whale group and got them to take her out on the river for three days and collect data with them. So uh, uh, she really uh, must have been pretty persuasive. Um, we've had people in the past do projects on geese. Um, looking at things like activity and goose flocks, how many of them are actually eating versus watching for predators. Um, we've had other actually beluga behavioral projects where people have just sat on the shore and counted like the number of juveniles versus adults by going by and you were testing ideas about group size and this kind of thing. I mean, the key thing about all of these, oh, we've, we've had a bunch of studies where people have looked at things like pollinators, um, the key about all of these things is that they are things where you, yeah, you really can collect enough data in three days. It's not a long period, but if you're willing to sit out there for eight hours watching bumblebees, you'll have a mountain of data by the time that you're, you actually need to start analyzing. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can you go home in the evening? <laughs> It depends what you consider home to be. Your home will be the study center. <laughs> okay. 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 If, if there are no other questions, I think we'll just call it quits. Um, but again, watch for more information online and, and don't hesitate to contact me if you'd like more. We will have another information session in the spring. At that point, we'll have firm dates. Well, we'll have them long before that. Um, we'll also have updated syllabus and that kind of thing. Um, um, so yeah, keep, keep an eye open for updates too. Okay, great. Well, thank you all. And hopefully I'll see you there.